mobile homes there's three three types of mobile homes one personal property all they own is the coach they own no real estate and it would be personal property not real property the second type is one where they own a share of the land and so it's essentially almost a condo ownership type of mobile home the third type is it's called the PUD a planned unit development where they actually own the site on which their coach sits and then they share the common areas the streets the clubhouse the pool etc we can usually find out what type of mobile home it is just by doing some research and looking at the parks etc but again if you ask your clients it'll help just streamline what we have to do and make sure that everyone's on the same page uh, vacant land the most important parts about uh, appraising vacant land well there's there's lots of important parts but first of all is it accessible there's a lot of times we're asked to appraise vacant land out in the back country and there's no legal access and that will significantly impact the value and without getting a title report we won't know for certain if there's legal access to the real property um, asking your clients about any improvements is also helpful are there any structures a barn uh, fencing are there any utilities wells electrical again those are things that significantly significantly impact the value and a lot of times especially out in the backcountry, we may not even get close to seeing the property, so we'll never know. A lot of times we have to rely on aerial photography. Um, a lot of times there's locked gates we can't get through. Um, so again, a lot of communication at the uh, onset of our appraisal assignment really helps in expediting the return of the completed appraisal, as well as the accuracy of the appraisal. Um, let's talk about timeshares. Um, my office is in Poway, which unfortunately or fortunately happens to be located near Lawrence Welk Village, so I get dozens of timeshares for Lawrence Welk. Um, the main points and the useful information for timeshares is what do they own? Again, there's a lot of different types of timeshares. It can be a floating week or a fixed week of time that they get the rights to use the timeshare. It can also be a, a set amount of points. They don't own any, any real property. They own points to use real property. And so again, the different types of timeshares can vary. And again, we can investigate it to a degree, but it helps to have the accurate information on the onset to, to make sure that we can accurately represent it. A couple other things on timeshares. If you know the type of unit, again, that can affect the value. If it's a studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, if it's an ocean view versus a non-ocean view, again, on the coastal properties, the, uh, the ocean views can command a premium, and those are the types of things that'll affect the uh, ultimate appraised value. Um, on income properties, Again, a rent roll, which delineates the unit mix. Again, are we appraising studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms? Their uh, vacancy rates. That information is vital for us to be able to put together the, the, the appraisal. Uh, the income and expense statements are helpful for a, a minimum of a year. We prefer three years of income and expense statements show what the uh, rents that are being collected, what the vacancy levels are, what the water bills, electric bills, uh, uh, trash collection bills, management expenses, etc. Those all help in determining the net operating income of the income property and that's what will direct us towards the uh, value conclusion. Um, let's see. As far as other types of commercial properties, in addition to the income and expense statements, the, uh, a copy of the lease and any addenda to the lease is uh, very, very important. It's, it's 
I don't want to say impossible, but very difficult to appraise a property that is uh, leased to a business without knowing the terms of the lease, who pays for what, how long the lease, the term of the lease is. Again, those things will significantly impact the value. And without a copy of the lease, it's, again, very difficult to, to analyze the property. Um, personal property. Uh, it's very helpful when uh, the cover letter gives us an indication of what the pro uh, personal property may include. Um, again, most practitioners that have been doing it a, a while know that we love having the information of its ordinary, uh, everyday furnishings. Their value is X. And most times, unless there's kind of a discrepancy in the facts, we'll use that number. We ask that significant items be separately line itemed. Uh, something like a pool table, a piano, things that will have value that aren't usually ordinary and typical household furnishings. Um, things like jewelry, the more information we have, the better. Um, if there's an insurance appraisal, it provides a lot of the factual information that we're looking for. What type of uh, precious metals might be in this piece? What type of uh, quality of diamond might be in this piece? Um, those are things that I think in my 20 years, I've never seen a piece of jewelry physically. It's always been pictures. It's always been through an insurance appraisal. It's always been you know, through someone's description. So the more information we have in appraising jewelry, uh, the more accurate we can represent the value. Um, as far as uh, artwork, the same thing that I just said uh, about the jewelry. If there is an insurance appraisal, it's going to delineate the, the factual information. How big is the piece? Who created the piece? Um, it, it just gives us the starting point of what it is that we're going to appraise. Um, one thing that wasn't uh, uh, listed here was uh, privately held companies. Um, Privately held companies can be very difficult to get any information. So the more information that you can provide, um, the better that we can put together our valuation. Um, we ask in our uh, probate referee guide, there's a wish list that's a page long of the information that we'd like. Again, in my 20 years of being a probate referee, I, I don't think I've gotten everything on that list. But the main points are the operating statements, preferably three years, and the balance sheet at or near the date of death. Those documents will list the assets and how the cash flow of the business operates. And we rely heavily on those documents. So again, um, to have those at the onset of the assignment will help with the valuation. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen for some other things that uh, we cover. Um, when it comes to personal property also, I, I every so often get an uh, inventory of the house, the car, and there's 55 or 60 items listed as personal property from, you know, the 25 cubic refrigerator that's 25 years old, three tube TVs in the garage, um, you know, 20 pair of, uh, of, of high heel shoes that I don't <laughs> and. And usually I'll ask, well, why did you detail it? Well, I thought I had to. So like Frank said, usually that's kind of typical, normal, personal property. Items of high value should be separated out. Um, so, uh, and usually once in a while someone says, well, some of this is specifically bequested, so we need separate values on it. And I'll work with, so, and we'll all do that to work with you. But to try to value every single item uh, is, um, is, is difficult and you know you're putting five dollars on something ten dollars on something um, the other thing we see is where you'll bring in a uh, I'll call it a garage sale company that comes in and sells everything and sometimes they'll keep 30 40 50 percent of the proceeds um, if you're gonna do that please send us a list of what was sold with the gross proceeds we're not using the net proceeds on that because 
uh, the commissions were paid to sell it. Like on a house, we value a house, we don't deduct out the commission that maybe will be paid on the house to determine the value. So that's as a heads up on that. Um, Stocks, options, bonds, uh, typically on stock list out the type of, don't, if it's a Merrill Lynch brokerage account, <laughs> make sure you list each item. Don't say Merrill Lynch brokerage account 4562 and send us a statement. Um, you have to list each item that's held in that account. So, you know, if it's 100 shares of Qualcomm, 300 shares of Exxon, make sure you list those out. Um, bonds, put the QCIP on the inventory. Um, it's it's really the only way we can value it. So if you have a, you know, a bond, put that on there. Um, we dread those 50 pages of $50 U.S. savings bonds that <laughs> that that were collected for 40 years and never cashed in, and we have to go in and, and value each one of them. So uh, that can take a whole day for somebody to do that, and we see that, right? Options. Um, typically, just a basic big picture on options, if somebody was working, let's say, for Qualcomm or Viastat or one of the companies here, they die, they might have stock options in the company. Some of them vested, some of them not vested. Those that are vested, you know, what we need to know is what's, I call it the strike price, what do they buy them at? What can they buy them at? And then we look at the date of death value. So um, let's say they can buy shares at $10 a share, but it's trading at 50 there's a $40 a share profit at they, at when they died if there's that spread. Uh, there's more to it, but basically those are things we need to start on options is, you know, to see the contract sometimes, the option contract, because maybe if they didn't execute the options and they passed away, they might, the family might not be able to, they might be gone. So we need to know some of those details when we uh, value options. Promissory notes. Give us a copy of the promissory note. The amortization schedule, many times there's actually a schedule of the payments. Um, that's helpful, um, as well as if there's any payment issues. Um, recently I had one where they haven't made a payment in five years and it's unsecured and it's probably not worth anything. So, but to know those details, a copy of the note. Um, also, I can't tell you when I've seen where they say there's a promissory note, but there's no document. Not even a copy of a check, they just say, you know, Susie owes uh, mom's estate $40,000, but there's no evidence of it. So how do you value something that there's no evidence? Um, so uh, keep that in mind when you're looking at it. Copy of the note is really important. Partial interest, and this, I'm gonna jump a little, that and discounts. If someone owns 25% of a uh, entity that maybe owns a 20 unit apartment building, obviously we have to value the whole apartment building or the whole shopping center or the whole house then we would take their interest. Um, typically, we don't take a fractional discount and reduce that. Um, sometimes attorneys will ask us to do a discount. And um, my comment on that is if it's not a big interest, let's say they owned $150,000 in a $6 million net worth entity, I'll probably take 20% off for minority interest and lack of control. But if the IRS audits that, what the IRS looks for is a discount appraisal, which is a separate standalone appraisal that takes a pretty deep dive into tax court and cases that dealt with discounts for various types of uh, entities and reasons. So if it's a larger estate and you're looking for a substantial discount on the value, I highly recommend you have the probate referee that did the base value. You hire a company or an individual that's an expert in discount studies and have them do that full appraisal, um, especially if it's a taxable estate and you're going in with a million, a million and a half dollar discount. That's worth a lot to the bottom line to be successful to the family. So you want the very best report that has all that tax law in it, and that's typically not in uh, the, the scope of what we do most of the time. Um, the other thing I will do, if it's a petition and the house comes in at, let's say, 165000 to save the family all that cost of going through a probate, I'll, if it's a partial interest, I'll discount it to get them just under that 150 dollars so um, you can save the family and the client money to get that title cleared up. Judgments. If there's a lawsuit, um, many times it's still pending when they died, especially if it might have been a malpractice or... 
um, you know, uh, something else happened to them, they were killed. We don't know what the value is if the litigation is just starting. So most of the time we'll put not appraised at this time. As you submit your inventory, at least that's tagged in the inventory and highlighted um, until such time you would have more information. Um, to, to usually uh, it's a settlement. We see what the proceeds that came in from it. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, it's, we don't see a lot of those, but, but sometimes we do. So very difficult to value those without, because we're not, a, not even the attorney could value it when you're going into litigation. You know, you're suing someone for five million, you're not sure what you're gonna get. So um, again, not appraised at this time, it becomes a placeholder. Um, date of death years ago. We do get estates, someone goes to sell a house and mom died, dad died, the kids moved into the house and the date of death was 1958. <laughs> no one has cleared the title and it probably wasn't an inheritance tax from back then in the state of California. They just moved into the house and now the next set of family members died and the kids want to sell the house. The attorney goes in and says, Who's Mary? Oh, she died 40 years ago. <laughs> so guess what? You have to do, maybe it's a petition, depending on the value of the house, or a probate. You might have to do a full probate on that house. Um, my guess is that's the only thing they're gonna really know was in the estate way back when. Um, we value those. They're not easy at times. Uh, they can be difficult, but we value those. Um, I just had one in a trust case where I did a current valuation for uh, a litigation, but also they never did the valuation for 1998 date of death of mom. So I completed that, but the hard part was there's not a lot of data. It's commercial land that's developable in North County near the coast. So CoStar, which is one of our databases we use for commercial property, uh, not available. So it, it, you have to dig for best available data when it's that old, but we can do it. I did a 1928 date of death about five years ago for a house in National City. It was worth $400. You know, it just, the only thing, yeah, the only thing you can do is you go back, you can Google it and see what the average price of a house was in 1928 in San Diego, and that's what we use. You know, it's all about clearing title at that point. You know, someone dropped the ball years ago. So we do go back um, and, and do older date of deaths. And um, it's just part of our job, too. Uh, let's see, you want to touch on the next one? Communications? Sure. Okay. So, communicating with the referee when you believe the value may be too high or too low. Again, this is where the communication on the onset would perhaps have eliminated this. Um, a lot of times I'll get the phone call and that's when I'll find out about the crack slab or the problems with the property. Um, we always ask that you contact us. Again, we're happy to speak to you by phone. Uh, send us a letter with the facts of why you believe our value may be incorrect. Uh, a lot of times it's because we didn't know something significant about the asset, whether it's uh, an income property or a, a, a personal residence or a car. A lot of times we don't know the mileage, we don't know the condition, we don't know something that would significantly change our opinion of its value. So please feel free to contact us, let us know that there's an issue with what your client believes is the value of the asset and we'd be happy to address it, yes. It, it, it depends on the nature of the asset. A lot of times we'll, we're required to go look at the real property. So we'll go look at the house and we'll see a tarp on the roof. We'll, we'll call and say, hey, we saw a tarp. You know, is there a roof problem? And if there is, how significant is it? Was it there as of the date of death? And we'll investigate what it is that we saw. A lot of times we will have no indication that there's a problem with the property. And that's where we'll appraise the property as we see it from the street and we'll put a number on it and then someone will come back, oh, by the way, that property has a cracked slab. 
well at that point we know that our value isn't correct and so we'll we'll ask further questions a lot of times if there's something like a cracked slab it's it's great for everyone to know what's it going to cost to fix it there could be a, a hairline crack or there could be a significant separation in the uh, foundation that requires a complete redo of the foundation it could be a five thousand dollar fix or a five hundred thousand dollar fix and again the the nature of our final conclusion would be helped by knowing what those facts are and a lot of times we all know some estates don't have any money to send experts out there to investigate and we we don't have that expertise to say this foundation requires x to repair it so we have to make a the best most reasonable decision that we can based on what is going to happen i just had a case in uh, la mesa where from the front the house looked typical i mean it looked like every other 1960s home in this neighborhood well it turns out that most of the roof had caved in in the back there were water leaks inside so there was mold throughout the house and the retaining wall that went all the way well about halfway it was about 50 feet by eight feet was unsound so each of those re uh, repairs was on the order of 20 to 40 thousand dollars so we had appraised the home mid 400 thousands not knowing that there were these issues and after it was all said and done it was a significantly lower conclusion when we knew all the facts. Uh, me, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Mamie, uh, could you please re uh, repeat a question when one is asked? Absolutely. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, a couple other things on that, like one of them, and um, Marilyn and I have had long conversations on automobiles. <laughs> and I'm sure many of you have dealt with this. You have a car listed on the inventory, you provide it's fair condition, maybe there's a photograph, um, miles, the, uh, and, and what we typically use and the IRS uses as a guideline is we use the NADA books and we'll average retail and I believe it's a, a lend or a loan value and they're usually about 25% different, we'll average them. And then there's a chart for miles, like I just did a 2003 GMC Sierra and it was low miles so it actually, wanted to add another $3,000 to the value because it was only had 34,000 miles on it. So that's basically what we use to value an automobile. Um, sometimes it's not accurate. It, it say 90% of the time it works, nobody complains, they sell the cars for that or it gets transferred. Um, we do get where, well, we sold the car to CarMax for $7,000, but your value is 9,500. CarMax is a wholesale value. And they'll say, well, the administrator just didn't want to bother with it. She just took it over there and, and sold it. We're not going to get down to that value. That's, that, that was a wholesale value on that car. Um, but if there's mechanical issues, I think when Maryland, we had a car with mechanical issues and other issues that maybe wasn't obvious, well, it, it, then there's probably a decent argument for adjustments to get to a lower value. Um, and uh, uh, it's the same on motorhomes when we get motorhomes. Uh, there, there, there's a little bit of subjectivity in how we value those, but many times when it's a second debt, they just wholesale them to, you know, a wholesale lot for a lot of times 50% of the value. Um, a couple quick stories that I told in the I had once a watch, personal property in it. They put on a Piaget watch 1947. They put a recommended value of $300. So. Because of our education, we have personal property, we have, so I was generally familiar with different brands of watches. So I said, you guys need to take this to an expert that can value this watch. They hemmed and hawed. The appraisal came back at $50,000 for this watch. It happened to be a special edition in 47, I think 30 of them were made. And then they took it up to Bonhams on their watch auction and sold it for like $58,000. So, you know, as referees, we have general knowledge, so sometimes something that, that, that could be highly valuable, and if we ask you to take it to the next step, um, it's probably worth it to the estate and everybody else in that respect. 
Um, so we see that sometimes. Should I? Time to complete appraisals. We have 60 days to complete the appraisal and um, we hold our files for three years. Um, very rare someone asks for the backup real property valuation. Um, by state statute, if you call us, the attorney or the appropriate person, and ask for the backup on the real estate, we need to send it to you. And we hold it for three years. Um, and, and that would be backup in anything we valued. Um, again, it's very rare I get that. Um, I would actually recommend if you're filing a 706, you probably don't want to just put in the DE 160 and 161. You probably want the backup on the valuations if you're filing a 706. Um, so three years holding the file. The other thing I tell you, if you're having problems with a referee in Southern California, I'm the ethics chair in Southern California, and you're 30, 40, 60 days, 75, 80 days, send me an email. I'll find out what's going on. Um, half the time, the, in the inventory was never received for whatever reason. So um, I have attorneys that after 30 days send me a quick email and said, how are you doing on this? Knowing it might not be ready, they just want to make sure I got it. Um, and uh, I think one other thing, people get failure to perform notices. And Frank can touch on how we get those and what we do with them. <laughs> Again, anytime there's a court date or some other critical date that you need the probate referee to know, please put it in the cover letter. Um, a lot of times we'll get the inventory and then two or three days later, we'll get the phone call. Oh, by the way, you know, I have a court date next week. Will the inventory be done? And it's nice to know it up front so that we can, you know, try to help and try to expedite. There's some estates where we wouldn't be able to get it done in a week. There's just no way. It's a, a complicated uh, privately held company. It's, you know, a 3,000 acre ranch out in Warner Springs. Again, there's just some appraisals that take more than a week to do. If, if we know that we can help you out, we'll do our best to try. But having it in the cover letter will just help spell it out and help us know that you're trying to meet a deadline and we can try to work with you with that. Um, there was another uh, a bullet point here on appraisals used for estate tax returns. Most of the appraisals that we do are solely for the superior court and sometimes we know or don't know that they're going to be used for other purposes. If you're planning to use our valuation for other purposes, please let us know and we can help you help your client. Um, if it's a large apartment building that's part of a large high value estate, we won't, we, we can complete a more thorough report that will meet the IRS requirements instead of just pr producing a streamlined appraisal that will put the uh, value for the uh, probate court. So again, communication is important there to let us know what your thoughts or intentions are of our work because otherwise we have no idea to know that you're going to be including it with a 706 and then it doesn't pass muster with the IRS. So again, a, a little communication will go a long way with that. Any questions at this, any uh, questions or? Just yeah, uh, Rick Bauman, on the uh, privately held corporation, you mentioned you want three years of statements. Are you talking about profit and loss? Yes. Or the bank statements or both? The question was, on a privately held company, do you want uh, three years of income and expense statements or bank statements? I would say income and expense statements on the prop, on the business, revenue, expenses. You know, if, uh, if it's a widget manufacturer or something, you know, making something, we want to, see, if possible, see three years of income and expenses. Also, the balance sheet closest to date of death because basically you're going to value that business and if it's sitting on a bunch of cash or a bunch of cars and trucks too, we have to value those with to get to the proper value of that entity. Um, I just did one, the guy owned 20,000 web addresses. That was his business. It wasn't worth anything. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think the idea was is it's probably 
I'm going to make a lot of money because Google and others are going to come to me and buy these. But um, all he did is write checks to, to, to continue with these web addresses. So, um, and they gave me tax returns and everything was zero on them. There was no assets, they, no liabilities, no bank account. Um, so uh, the more, inf I guess the, the, the goal is the more information you give us on any item we're appraising, the faster and more accurate and better we can do that for you. That's kind of like the big picture takeaway here. More information is better than less. Any other questions in the back? So the question was, is um, using the probate record to do non-probate appointed work, I'll, I'll generically call it trust. Um, most referees will do trust appraisal work. Um, I think Frank and I probably do more than any other referee in San Diego when it comes to trust work. And most of it usually is just a single family home. Um, the fee is negotiable. It really depends on the amount of time and the work involved, and uh, our, our fee structures could be very different from each other, and it's the same across the state of California. So for me, if you call me, I need to know the property address, where it's located, date of death, and then I'll do a little bit of work and quote a fee. Um, in other parts of the state, and I know some referees here, they charge statutory no matter what it is. So if it's a $2 million house, they're going to charge you the $2,000 fee plus expenses. Um, and others uh, won't charge that much. It will really be based on the amount of work that's involved and the time and the exposure on it. Uh, Frank, you, know, you want to add anything to that? Or? Okay. So, so that's, and, and so we're all available to do that, some more than others. If you go to a referee in LA, LA tends to be a lot more expensive than us. So, like I had a house done up there and uh, it was a trust and I, I sourced out just the house up there to help the attorney and the referee up there charged me $1,500 to do the house. It was in Pacific Palisades. It was a pretty nice house and he wanted to go inside it. So. Um, Always ask the referee what they're going to charge up front. Don't be embarrassed to ask them. That's your right. It, it's a private negotiated fee agreement. Um, on probate, it's statutory. And I want to remind everybody on probate, the fee, our fee is a maximum of $10,000 for an estate. Uh, and then we can charge for reappraisals as they come through afterwards. Um, if you see a referee that you had a $15 million estate, and, he, and there were three partials and he charged you $15,000, that's not allowable unless the court stipulates and there's an order to pay extraordinary fees. So if you ever see that, I want to know about it because that's not allowed unless agreed to and approved by the judge. How are we doing on time? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'll do the residential. Yeah. We were asked to uh, give a, a brief update about the current trends in real estate. Um, I'm going to talk about the residential side of the market. And the San Diego County has such a variety of real estate, um, from entry level condos to high end oceanfront estates. And in general, the market is relatively strong. There are segments of the market though that are seeing some price declines and they tend to be the, the upper end luxury market the rancho santa fe uh, point loma coronado markets have seen some softening where some of the entry level more affordable again af affordable housing is sort of a tough word to use in real estate but in san diego county the, the more entry level markets um, some of the uh, inland oceanside zip codes um, uh, or some of the other ones, uh, El Cajon, National City saw some uh, modest price gains. I, there was a good article in the paper on Sunday talking about 
the lack of sales, and again, the volume or velocity of the sales has really uh, uh, slowed down over the last, uh, boy, two to three years, uh, probably the last two years. The prices have stayed, but the number of sales have really declined in, in throughout the county. Um, probably the strongest market, though, is the apartment sector. Um, it represents the most basic housing in San Diego County, and the demand for apartments is off the charts, and the prices have been off the charts. So um, any of your clients that own multifamily properties may be surprised to see what has happened in the last two to three years, five years, 10 years with the pricing of apartments. And, and touching a little bit on apartments, uh, uh, we have to value as the date of death. So uh, many times if a family owns a 10 unit apartment building in North Park, City Heights, Normal Heights, you'll see, let's say it's all one bedrooms, you'll see the rent at 800 a month. When the market is 13, 14, 1500 a month. We can't use for the income approach to value it, we can't use those way below market rents. We have to value at market. So we'll do, um, I'll do a bit of a market study, look on Craigslist if it's a smaller infill, and I'm looking for comps of most similar apartments, and that will be my market rents that I'll use for that. Um, in terms of valuations, uh, it's, I'm not shocked anymore, but a 10 unit building in North Park uh, is probably worth 2.2 million today. Probably 200, and, so, and I'm seeing now close at 250,000 a door, so two and a half million for a 10 unit apartment building. Um, National City, I just looked at a three unit apartment building, kind of dumpy 1940s, and the valuation was $700,000 where five years ago it was probably 350. So a huge run up in valuations on apartment projects, because as Frank said, the demand is through the roof. Uh, people are scared of investors of the stock market and they feel like housing is the thing to buy. Um, we see that also with some commercial property. Um, some of the triple nets, like if your client owns a, a long-term lease with Jack in the Box in San Diego, that's probably trading at a five cap rate or below right now if there's still some years on the lease, uh, where five years ago it was probably a six and a half percent. So um, the, I call it the income property world. Values are way up in most, in most cases in San Diego and um, I have some clients, estate planning attorneys that their clients own two or three of these projects um, and all of a sudden they got it, they didn't realize that they have an estate tax issue because now the values, they're not, no debt on it. They now have a $15 million estate where the family for years thought maybe it was five or six million. So check in with your clients too if you're an estate planning attorney and, and do an inventory because maybe there's something else that needs to be done because of the significant appreciation in the last three or four years. Plus, you get billable hours for doing that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a piece of property that has a single family residence on it, but it's zoned for, let's say, four, do you do appraisal on I mean, four units or just as is? Uh, the question was, if it's a single family home that has the underlying zoning for multiple units, do we appraise it as a single family home or the multiple units? The answer is, we, when we're appraising any type of property, we'll look at the zoning and we'll look at the property as if it were available to its highest and best use. So there's lots of neighborhoods in San Diego where you see the vintage 1950s cottage on a main thoroughfare that's an attorney's office, a doctor's office, a real estate office. Again, it's a house, but it's being used for commercial purposes. That's what we're going to appraise, is what's there and what it can be used for. So again, we'll look for similar properties, similar houses with the same underlying zone, and see what investors are paying for it. Again, sometimes, especially in the beach area, they don't even care about the little house. They're looking at the dirt. And so we'll, as appraisers, know that we're not appraising that little house. It's gonna be scraped the minute escrow closes. And they're gonna look for the site where they can put their four units. And so that's what we'll value. Yeah.
Um, I see that sometimes, and question. if it's, I do. A oh, question. The question is if um, it, it's a court matter and someone dies January 1st, the family sold the house, they had powers or the fiduciary, they sold the house 60 days after date of death, they listed it maybe 10 days after the person died, and it's marketed 30 days, they get multiple offers or whatever, and it closes escrow, and then in June, they say, oh, we got to do the probate now. So it's already done and over with. Um, most cases, if it's been listed for sale and exposed like that, um, our valuation should be pretty close to that. It's not an exact science, so uh, it should be pretty close. But many times when I see that, the house has been sold to a flipper without ever being marketed. And most of the time it's being sold for something less than we can appraise it at because the family just said, or, or and I've never seen it with a fiduciary, but with a family member that's the administrator, it's like, let's just get rid of it. We can't deal with this. So they'll take 400000 when maybe on the open market, as is condition, they could have got four eighty, dollars 500000 But if it's listed and exposed for sale, probably two, three months afterwards, and I would argue because the market's kind of been relatively flat the last six months, I would probably, you know, use that as a benchmark. But I got to pull comps and support that value. Um, and if it was fully marketed, we should be able to do that. Does that answer that one? Uh, yes. Okay. I have something to add. A lot of times in that um, scenario, well, we'll, my office will always talk to the broker that was involved because a lot of times when a house is marketed, it's enhanced to achieve a better price. So that might include new carpet, new paint, you know, freshening up the landscaping, cleaning up things. And that's not the property that was there as of the date of death. So sometimes there could be a spread depending on what they did to the property. And that's what we try to do is investigate and find out from everyone that was involved what was done, was anything changed, so that we know where the property stood going back to the date of death. Take this one. Um, the question was, if the property has been improved and uh, an addition has been uh, permitted on the property, how long might it take to hit the public record? And the answer is, it might take forever. Sometimes it never gets there. So again, that's part of the communication. Uh, a lot of times, the cover letter will tell me, you know, the house is a three bedroom, two bath, approximately 1,500 square feet. Well, the public record says two bedroom, one bath, 800 square feet. Why is there a discrepancy? Because perhaps the, the permitted addition never made it to the public record, or there was never a permit to begin with. And again, unpermitted additions can significantly impact the value. And so for us to know that information is very useful. Um, as probate referees, we're entitled to go into the tax assessor records. And their records are, are much better than many of the municipalities because the municipalities may not have existed when the house was added onto. So again, the taxing authority deals with money and so they keep better records. <laughs> and so I probably go down there a couple times a month and it's all been commu computerized. Just a few years ago, it was all on microfiche, which was Again, harder to analyze because you couldn't read it. But um, t to answer your question, sometimes those never make it. And the homeowner needs to know that because when they go to sell, the realtors want to convey or uh, characterize the property accurately. And the square footage is a vital piece of information. Any other questions? It's, it's, um, there's a couple things on that. The rent control, knowing about what's happening with the statewide rent control, I believe it's, it's going to the Senate floor. And from what I hear, there's a good chance it's going to go through, which will limit rent increases on apartment buildings. Um, 
to 7% plus to, uh, inflation. Um, and there's also another initiative qualified for the 2020 ballot to do a split roll and take away Prop 13 from commercial properties. And um, what that will do, for example, you have that 10 unit apartment building that's being carried at $450,000. So the family's paying maybe 5,000 a year in property taxes, but the place is worth two and a half million dollars. They're keeping their rents low. They're gonna get hit in 2022, potentially, if it passes with a $25,000 a year property tax bill. Um, so it's gonna create a lot of anxiety, especially for longtime owners of property. Um, I'm not rendering opinion whether it should be right or wrong because it's a political thing, but that could hit people really hard. So um, rent control, I think, is going to happen. I think it's going to also happen possibly in some of the municipalities. Um, long run, you know, all the economics show it doesn't work in the long run. So um, you have your inventory. A supplemental would be other things you found that weren't included in the original inventory. Um, sometimes we see partials. We'll see partial one, partial two, and a final. Maybe do this. They want to sell the house, and they want to get that done first because they're still marshalling the other assets, or they're not quite sure what needs to be probated. Um, correctings. I value a house at 450000 and there's a cracked slab and other things, and it's already been filed, so you would you would have a correcting to show the value, let's say it was 380, so you show a difference. Um, sometimes, if that was the only item I've seen, attorneys just file an amended instead and just override what was filed. And I think some of that depends on what's easiest, amended or correcting, um, and what was on the inventory. Um, so that would be, did I touch on all the different, okay. Um, quickly, we have, um, and they're kindly, uh, Fiduciary Real Estate Services, I think they're here. They were kind enough to assist us in the last three or four years in producing a book called the Probate Referee Guide. It's a fairly detailed book that goes through um, how to prepare a, a DE-160, 161 with different asset classes. Um, we have some here, you're welcome to take them. It is on our website, we're trying to become more green, so um, you can access it on our website too. There's a section that will say the probate referee guide. So afterwards, you're welcome to take one. I don't know if we have enough for everybody, but it's a great resource for attorneys and fiduciaries looking at the types of assets and how to, how to set them up on the inventories. Well, again, thank you all for being here. These gentlemen are going to stay because they want to meet each and every one of you. So they've got the next, what, four and a half hours to greet each of you. And on your chairs, just if you would take a minute for us, you can complete the evaluation. Those of you that want to join us next month to hear Greg and Rixie, get a little information on your seat as well. We'd love to have you join us. And then, of course, for fiduciaries and attorneys, um, don't forget to let us know whether or not you're interested in joining us for our, our annual event, which is going to be really special this year. Um, there's a sign-up sheet outside that you can uh, leave your name and information, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you.
Yeah, I made everything outside. <laughs> <laughs> 